I just wanted to uh, mention Julian's background. Um, so Julian founded the Jasper Ridge uh, Biological Preserve Banding Site that they're going to talk about today. Uh, they founded it while they were a sophomore at Stanford, an undergraduate. Um, they then founded a second banding station uh, the year after again, as an undergraduate, uh, their determination to make bird banding happen at these sites was really remarkable. Uh, I've, I volunteered um, early on and uh, was just shocked to find that they didn't have a car, uh, but were still managing to get to these sites to band um, regularly, <laughs> which is uh, amazing. Um, they uh, they kept those sites going um, more or less single handedly, drawing people in, uh, finding classmates to teach to band. Um, they were instrumental in putting together a, a banding related collaboration between us at SFBBO and Stanford uh, and a number of other colleges and universities in the area. Um, this collaboration has led to internships and classes and uh, looks like it's probably going to get bigger um, and will probably end up impacting hundreds of Bay Area students. Um, they've been carrying out uh, many research projects. Um, I, I mean, at, at least a PhD's worth of research projects at this point, I would say. Um, and uh, I will I will let them talk about that. Uh, but the, and they have many ideas. Um, and then also, uh, I mean, that's oh, and I should also say, uh, Julian was a, um, a staff scientist at SFBBO for a summer. Um, and, uh, and that was fabulous. Um, but but you know, that's that's the whole resume, but I also just want to say that Julian's really fun to band with. Um, they're always noticing these details in the birds. They pay attention to the common birds just as much as the rare birds. Um, they're great about teaching you uh, what they know, and, uh, and they really love the birds, and that comes through. So, uh, yeah, I hope, I hope you enjoy today's talk. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, Katie, and let me get my screen shared. All right, so um, I'm gonna be talking today about the current research that we have going on at the Coyote Creek Field Station and the Jasper Ridge Biological Preserve, which are two banding sites in the San Francisco Bay region. Um, sort of like as our migration route for the talk today, I'm gonna to start with a short introduction and overview to provide some context to our field sites and the methods that we use. Um, the bulk of the talk is gonna be about our recent studies on molt in California tohees and the effects of climate change on molt, as well as some methodological studies in sort of evaluating these methods, which is a very important part of science. Um, throughout the talk, I'll be talking about future work that we have going on, and then there'll be some time for questions. So this is just sort of an overview map of the South Bay. So we have over here by Milpitas, the Coyote Creek Field Station, which has been operating since 1984. And then over here by Stanford on Stanford lands, as Katie mentioned, are two stations that I started, um, one at the Jasper Ridge Biological Preserve in 2018 and another along the Los Trancos Creek, which is nearby in 2019. And so, Together, these three sites represent the bulk of our land bird monitoring and research efforts in the Bay Area. It's important to recognize that this is on the unceded land of the people who make up the modern day Muwekma Ohlone tribe. Um, and there's lots of wonderful resources to learn more about um, them and sort of what they're currently doing and working towards and the ways that we can help. So the links are there and I encourage everyone. So some of you may be familiar with bird banding in general, others may not be. And I wanted to give just sort of a brief overview of this process. And so for land birds, often the main tool that we use is a mist net which I have a photo of here. And mist nets are notoriously difficult to take photos of um, because they're fairly invisible. And so the way it's set up, it's about two and a half meters tall and about 12 meters long. And it's made of a very fine mesh. And it forms these four large horizontal pockets that you can 
and birds are caught passively. Um, so as they're just sort of flying about maneuvering in their everyday life, if they fly through a spot that has a mist net, they'll hit the net and fall into one of the pockets. And then someone who's trained to handle birds will come and remove them from the net. So that's sort of like how we capture a wild bird. And generally our standard procedure is that we open our nets at a specific study site on a day we're operating 30 minutes before sunrise and operate them for a five hour period. The nets stay more or less in the same exact place every time that we're operating consistently through time because having that um, standardized design is really important to allow us to compare data between days, between months, between years. Um, and that uh, allows us to do some of the really interesting studies that we have sort of with long time trends and periods. So we catch a bird, we have it in our hand. It's important to think about what's the value of that as opposed to just watching the birds and observing and having more observational studies. So for starters, it allows us to identify individuals. So each bird, it's a metal band on its leg that has a nine digit number. And that number sequence is unique across the Americas. So no other bird that's captured and banded in the Americas is gonna have that same number. And that allows us to follow the birds through space and through time as we recapture them or other researchers in other locations might recapture. And at our study sites, we actually have a very high recapture rate. Probably more than half of the birds that we capture in a given year are birds we've banded in previous years. Um, and so we really get to know these birds across their life. We see them at multiple points. And so we have really good long-term data on specific individuals. We get information on the size and shape of bird, the morphology, so we take different measurements. We can learn some information about their physiology or their internal conditions that we wouldn't otherwise know, specifically related to reproduction and molting. So here in this photo, this is of a brood patch, which is the physiological state that birds develop when they're actively incubating eggs and chicks. And so this, when we catch a bird that has this on it, we know that they are currently raising young and offspring. And there's also sort of what we might consider metadata that's really valuable. So the location that we're at, the date of the year, um, and the time of day, those are all important data as well that we can um, use to understand bird populations. So all of this together lets us do research on the avian life cycle, which we can think of really as having three main components. Sort of the two that people are most familiar with are reproduction and migration, um, but also a really important stage in the life cycle is molting. Molting is when birds replace their feathers. And that's sort of where I'm gonna start today. So there's a few important things to know about so the first is that feathers are sort of like the most important characteristic of living birds. It's sort of like what defines them as a group of organisms. Um, and feathers allow birds to regulate internal conditions, keep a constant body temperature. They allow birds to fly, and they also allow birds to communicate among many other functions. But their structure breaks down over time, especially with exposure to UV light from the sun. And so they require a periodic replacement in order to meet the demands of these activities and these functions. In North America, most of our bird species replace all of their feathers once a year. And it's usually at the end of the breeding season. So that's around August to October and they'll replace them in a predictable sequence. So they don't, there's very few species that sort of drop all their feathers all at once. They usually just molt a few at a time. That way they are still able to fly and still able to regulate temperature. So you can see in this series of photos, the bottom photo is sort of like what a normal California towhee wing looks like with all of its feathers fully grown. The photo above, you can see that there are some gaps 
and there are feathers growing. And so this is what the wing of the tohi looks like when they're actively molting. And you can see because there are these gaps, this negative space in the wing, you can imagine there is reduced function. So when birds are molting, it's a vulnerable period of their life because they aren't as good at flying, they aren't as good at regulating their body temperature. Um, so it's a really critical stage in their life cycle. So the first study that we recently published that we're gonna talk about was identifying a novel molt pattern in California tohis. And this is a very familiar bird for people who live in California and specifically the Bay Area. They're really common in backyards, in urban parks. Um, they're really well adapted to human environments. And they're, one of the reasons they're interesting is because they're essentially endemic to the California floristic province. They don't really extend much beyond that. And they like to live in sort of dry, shrubby, chaparral type habitat. And they're ground foragers, they like to stay low, they eat seeds and things like that, but they can crack with their large bills. And so songbirds have a really big task. They start off like this in the nest, and in a period of a few days, they need to become this, a fully adult bird. And they do this really rapidly. Um, so for a California tohi, this is gonna happen over a period of 20 to 30 days. And that requires a lot of energy and a lot of nutrition. But there's a big trade-off. To grow that fast, the feathers that are grown are really poor quality. And the reason that songbirds grow this fast in the nest is because they're sort of just sitting ducks. They're really vulnerable to predators when they can't, when they're not mobile. And so there's this evolutionary pressure to leave the nest as quickly as possible. The trade-off of that is they leave the nest with really poor quality feathers. In response, songbirds have evolved a replacement of feathers soon after they, after they leave the nest. And we call that the preformative mold. And that terminology really isn't important, but I just put that in there in case um, any other banders are present um, who might be interested. But the main thing to know is that they grow all these poor quality feathers in the nest, then they leave and they need to replace feathers immediately. When they do that replacement, they, for most species, they only replace a certain percentage of their feathers. So they're not gonna replace all of them. And for California towhees, they replace all of their body and head feathers but they don't replace any of their flight feathers. So the feathers in their wing and on their tail, they'll keep the ones that they grew in the nest until the next year when they go through an, a complete molt like all adult birds do. We started noticing something a little bit different in the towhees at our study site. And so at the Los Trancos Creek Banding Station, we caught this towhee here last October. And it was one that we had initially banded. So it was a recapture bird. It was a bird we banded as, um, a few months earlier as a baby. And what we saw was it had actually replaced its, some of its flight feathers. And so these, this is a photo of both of its wings. You can see that these outer two wing feathers on both sides, both wings, they're a little bit darker and the tips of them are much, have far less wear. So if you look at sort of these inner flight feathers, they're much more frayed and there's some nicks in them. Whereas the, the edge of these outer feathers is much more smooth and it's much darker. And that indicates to us that these outer feathers were replaced more recently than the rest of them. And so this puzzled us because it's a, pattern of feather replacement that is not typical for this species that hadn't been documented for this species before. And we've banded a lot of California tohis over the years because they're very common. So we decided we were gonna look through all of our banding records to see had anyone else noticed over the 40 years of banding at the Coyote Creek Field Station, has this ever been documented before? And what we found is that it had. So since 1984, this pattern of molt was documented in five out of 369 young California tokens. So about 1% of our population. So pretty low, but present. 
Interestingly, the earliest record of this was from 2002, so 20 years into the research project. We also know that Peter Pyle, who's a researcher with the Institute for Bird Populations, examined all the California towhee specimens at the Cal Academy of Sciences and in um, Berkeley's collections um, up until 1997. And he did not find this molt pattern present in any of those specimens. And so this suggests that this might be a recent or contemporary change, perhaps in response to changing climate, changing environmental conditions. To really establish that though, we would need to examine the same collections again for the specimens 1997 to the present. Um, and at some point over the next few months, I do hope to do that, to sort of see um, if in fact this is a change that's happened over time as opposed to sort of just random observations that we've made. So that's sort of a brief overview of this first study. And I'm gonna to return to thinking about the avian life cycle as I talk about our other study on molt. And so when we think about how climate change is impacting organisms, there's a lot of work that's been done for birds around reproduction, around migration. So we know that birds are migrating earlier in the spring, we know that Breeding ranges have been expanding northward for a lot of species. Um, there are some species even like of swallows that are now breeding in both hemispheres. So they'll breed in the northern hemisphere, they'll migrate to the southern hemisphere, they'll breed again and they'll come back. So there's a lot that we know about migration and reproduction that's changing. Despite the fact that molting is the most important part of the avian life cycle and that it's the only part that birds can't skip. So birds can skip migration, they can skip reproducing if they need to. We don't know of a single instance of a bird ever skipping its molt. So it's a really important part of its life, but we know basically nothing about how climate change is modifying this state. And so this is a big area for research. And we at, at our field stations actually have a lot of data on bird molt over the past 40 years. So it was a great data set to sort of start asking these questions. So just a little bit more information about molt before I jump into the, to that study. So it's important to know that the growth of feathers requires a lot of nutrients. Birds experience reduced flight ability and thermoregulation while they're molting. And so because of these two facts, we expect that natural selection would act in ways to optimize resource availability during molt. And that as humans modify our planet, these changes are likely um, to affect the molting period. Whether that means shifting the timing of molt, shifting the location of molt, shifting the number of feathers that are replaced, how fast they are replaced, things like that. Specifically in California, we can think about our annual climate and people who are from the Bay Area are familiar with this. We have this dramatic mismatch between temperature and precipitation. So the times of years when we get the most rain, it's the coldest. When it's the hottest, we don't get any precipitation at all. So if we overlay the life cycle of birds, we see that when birds are breeding, there's a fair amount of precipitation and sort of mild temperatures but when they get into the molting stage, really hot temperatures and essentially no precipitation. And so we might expect that these environmental conditions, temperature and precipitation, might be drivers or affect how birds molt and when they molt. So we looked at this for four of our most commonly captured species and for people who are birders in the area, you're probably very familiar with the, them. They're, these are all common backyard birds, yellow throats, bush tits, song sparrows, and chestnut backed chickadees. And so we looked at our data from 1987 to 2019 for these birds molt. Um, and so we wanted to see has the timing of molt changed? And some important things to know here in sort of developing our hypotheses as to what might happen that Molt is driven by things that are predictable 
like the photo period, which is how long day length is. So for many organisms, day length drives a lot of the hormonal changes in their bodies, and it drives a lot of sort of moving between stages. And so we know for birds that day length is an important part of when they reproduce and then when they molt. But then there's also unpredictable cues, things like climate that drive these patterns as well. And so we're really interested in sort of these unpredictable climactic cues. We know that species that have more plasticity will respond more strongly to unpredictable cues. So if there is sort of an ability to change and adjust timing or location, we're gonna see a larger response. And some species have a lot of plasticity and other species have very low behavioral plasticity. There's one study from 2005 with starlings that sort of experimentally housed them under different temperatures. And they observed that starlings initiated their molt sooner in the most warm conditions. And that's really the only study looking at temperature and molt for birds. And that was you know, 15 years ago. There is one note from wild populations of vireos in Texas that showed in a wet La Nina year, these vireos molted later. Um, but this only looked at two years, so it was very limited in time. It didn't have a long period of time. And so the difference they found between the two years could be due to the difference in climate between those years can also be due for, to any number of other factors. And so having a long-term data set is really important for answering these questions, which luckily we have. So based on sort of this background information, we hypothesize that in drier years, our birds would molt earlier, and that in warmer years, they would also molt earlier. I'm not gonna go into any of the details of sort of the statistics that we use and the analytical methods. If anyone's curious, I'm happy to chat about them, um, but I'm just gonna jump right into sort of the results that we found. And we ended up only finding significant results for two of our taxa, the yellow throats and the song sparrows, which in interestingly are associated with riparian habitat. In other words, habitats around water. And so we thought they might respond most strongly because they're sort of water dependent and California is characterized by lack of water essentially. And so we found that for every 100 millimeter increase in precipitation for yellow throats, we saw a 5.1 day delay in when they initiated molting. And for song sparrows, we saw a 6.5 day delay when they were molting. For temperature, we only had an effect in song sparrows. And we saw that as temperature increased every one degree Celsius, there was a 5.9 day advance in molt. And so these results were consistent broadly with the two hypotheses that we started off with. And there were a couple other interesting things to note from them. Oh, but before I get to that, I did want to show a visualization because I think it really shows these patterns well. So this is for common yellow throats with GSP as our acronym for growing season precipitation. So you can see the values. So we're going from just under 300 millimeters um, per season up to above 600, which is sort of like the range of values that we generally get in cal coastal California. Um, this is day of the year from one to 365. And then on the vertical axis, we have the probability that a bird that we've captured is actively molting. So we can see in this plot, we have it plotted for all the different values of precipitation. So if we look at our most dry value, we get molting earlier in the year than for our wettest value. So you can see that there is a shift to earlier under dry conditions. And so a possible reason for this could be um, linked to resources. And so 
you might expect that in drier years, years where our rainy season ends sooner, birds are gonna run out of the resources that they need to molt earlier because there's less vegetation growth, so there's less insects and other um, protein-rich resources available. And so there is sort of a pressure for them to molt their feathers sooner before these resources run out. So broadly, like I said, we found that our riparian associated species had more plasticity in their responses, whereas our generalists, which are the bush chicks and the chickadees, which are found in sort of a diverse range of habitats, um, they did not have significant responses to these climate variables. Um, and like I said already, our results were consistent with our hypotheses and they were consistent with what the only controlled experiment to date with the starlings found. They found sort of a similar thing that under warmer conditions, the birds molted sooner. Okay, um, so I'm gonna transition to our last study, which is sort of on a different topic. So this was, so the first two studies were looking at molt, um, which happens to be my favorite topic in bird biology. But it's also really important when you're doing research to evaluate your methods, because if your methods have biases in them, that's gonna affect your results. And every method in science has some bias in it. There's no method that exists on the face of the planet in science that doesn't have a bias. The question is, do you understand what your biases are? And do you then interpret your results with those biases as your limitations? And unfortunately, for bird banding and misnetting, there's been very, very little research on this. And so we wanted to sort of examine one aspect that could introduce bias, which is um, the height at which birds are captured. And so the fundamental assumpt assumption of catching birds and misnets is that they're going to be, they're going to produce an, a representative sample of the birds in an area with respect to whatever variables you're looking at. So for example, when we're looking at molt, are we capturing molting birds at the same frequency that we're capturing non-molting birds, right? Um, or are molting birds more likely to be captured than non-molting birds? That would then mean that there's a bias in this method. But there's a lack of literature testing these assumptions. Um, there's really only a handful of studies. And so we wanted to take a look at this. And we were interested in the height at which birds are captured. And so, as I said at the beginning, mist nets are really, they only extend about 2.5 meters high, but often the space that birds occupy goes well above 2.5 meters. And so if we think of this, um, curve here as sort of like where all the birds are flying through an area. If this is our mist net, we're only going to capture the birds that are flying at heights represented by the purple area. So that's what we might consider the probability of capture at the ground level on our mist nets, whereas what is above is what we miss, what we don't capture. And we might think of that as the probability of aerial capture sort of above the mist net. This could be problematic, for example, if there's a change in that over time. So if over time we see the heights at which birds are flying and being captured changes, we're gonna see a decline in the number of birds that we actually catch, but that might not actually signal that the populations are declining. It could just be that they're changing where they are flying within the habitat. For example, if the structure of the habitat changes over time, as trees grow and mature, as weather events come in and blow down the tallest trees, there's are like all of these sort of things that could affect where birds are in vertical space. And so this is what we wanted to look at. So luckily at our site, we actually have already set up um, sort of a study design to look at this. Um, and this was set up when the, research station first started in the 1980s. So they had good foresight that someone might wanna look at the height at which birds were captured. And so we have sort of stacked nets. And um, 
So I have them color coded here because again, they're notoriously difficult to photograph. So this is sort of the photograph without the labels and with um, the outline. So the yellow lines represent the four pockets of the lower net. The red outlines are the four pockets of the upper net. So collectively, they're about 5.2 meters in height. And our data indicates which net, the upper or the lower, the bird was captured in. And so we could estimate and look at whether bird specific species, specific ages, specific sexes of birds were more or less likely to be captured higher or lower. And so two of our goals in the study were to one, identify what species were biased in their height. Um, so sort of, are there specific species that we see biases in? Are there other species we don't? And then to test whether these biases might be related to foraging guilt. And so birds obviously um, forage at different parts of habitat. Um, they have different niches, niche, niches. Um, and so we wanted to see, is that related to where they get captured? So for example, some birds are ground foragers, other birds forage in sort of the lower canopy. We have birds that sort of focus more on the middle. We have birds that forage in the upper canopy. And then we have birds like hummingbirds, um, which are hovering foragers, and birds like flycatchers, which are aerial. And so we went through all of the species in our data set and we went through the literature that had been published and sort of grouped them based on what we know about their foraging behaviors into these different categories. And then we wanted to estimate sort of what is the bias of their capture height. And what we found was species like northern flickers, which are ground foragers, were captured at much lower levels than our other groups. And so sort of the uh, height of the bar uh, on this graph, you can think of as, as the height at which birds are being captured. And so you can see that species in our ground or ground to lower level foraging guilds were captured much lower than the birds in the other foraging guilds. So, sort of things like chickadees for sort of in the middle to upper part of the canopy. Hummingbirds obviously are hovering foragers. Flycatchers are, are aerial foragers. And so we can see that there's this sort of bias based on feeding behavior. And so this is really important because we can sort of use this in a predictive way. And so if there's a specific species that we wanted to target or conduct research on, we could look, okay, where does it forage? What guild does it fall in? And that could help us figure out what sort of study design we would need to maximize our capture. So if we wanted to really focus on hummingbirds, um, we would benefit from sort of these stacked nets that reach higher into the canopy than if we wanted to just focus on flickers or other ground foraging birds. And so, Conducting methods evaluations like this can help us sort of improve future research that we do. And something that we're doing now to get higher resolution data is not only are we keeping track of what net the birds are being captured in, but we're keeping track of which pocket they're captured in as well. And so that gives us resolution up to half a meter of what height the birds were flying in when they were captured. And so we're going to be doing some future research with that data as we gather more of it. So that sort of ends the three studies that I wanted to sort of briefly touch on today. And I know, you know, each one I only gave like seven or eight minutes on because sort of my goal for today was to cover a bunch of different projects we're working on. Um, but so I could go into none of them in, in a lot of detail. Um, I do want to thank all of the volunteers that helped with this research over the past 40 years. I also want to thank um, SFBBO staff members like Katie LaBarbera, Josh Golan, and Dan Wenny 
who have sort of helped with the mentorship through a lot of this research and helped keep these research projects going. And I also want to thank my advisor, my research advisors at Stanford, Rodolfo Durzo and Cindy Wilbur, who helped with a lot of this research as well. And I think we have time for some questions. Yes, thank you so much, Julian, for that excellent talk. I learned so much, me as someone who doesn't really know a lot about molt, especially, I learned a lot. And uh, yeah, it's so cool, all this great work that you're doing, these observations you're making, and all this work you're putting into you know, a better understanding the birds around here. So thank you again so much. That was really wonderful. And we do already have a number of questions in the chat. So I think I might just go ahead and jump in there. But if anybody has additional questions, go ahead and type those in the chat. Uh, so the first set of questions uh, will we'll go into the, the California tohi questions first. So um, one of them is, is it possible to determine the sex of the 1.4% of tohis in the data set that have the unusual molt? Oh, good question. Um, not in our existing data set because for California tohis, um, they don't show sexual dimorphism of size or plumage. So the only way to distinguish the sexes is during the breeding season when they're reproducing, they develop different um, physiology of their bodies. And that we can see when we're holding a bird in our hand. But first cycle birds, so birds that were just born, obviously are not reproducing until the next year. Um, and so the only way we, we might know their sex is if we captured them in a subsequent year while they were breeding. Uh, in the future, we could collect feather or blood samples that contain genetic information and look at their genetics to determine the sex and see. Um, but as a general rule of thumb for species where there aren't differences in plumage, um, we don't usually see differences in how they molt between the sexes. Usually that only happens for species that have plumage differences. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then another question on that topic. Um, how many California Toby specimens are there in the Cal Academy and at UC Berkeley compared with your data set from Jasper Ridge, Coyote Creek, et cetera? Yeah, so the specimens they have, they collectively, they have a couple hundred. That includes a lot of different types of specimens um, and not all of the ways that birds are preserved are necessarily useful for molt studies. Um, but there's a, there are a lot of them. Now, the bulk of them are from earlier years. Um, so sort of since 1997, there are fewer and fewer specimens that are collected. Um, so the data becomes a little more sparse. We certainly have many more capture records in our data set, um, but we are limited in the fact that we only have the data that we collected at the time that we had the birds. Whereas with museum specimens, researchers can always go back and collect more data from the specimen. All right, and then I saw that we had another question more recently about towhees, and there was some subsequent discussion. So this one was, there. there is a sound that they make that is kind of like a descending swishing sound. I have only seen it made while interacting with each other often chasing. Do you know what this means and why it isn't mentioned in some of the other bird guides that they've looked in? And then another person responded that the sound is a duetting call. Um, and there's a researcher named Lauren Benedict who has studied this. Uh, is there anything else you want to add to that, Julian? No, I'm, I'm actually not super familiar with their vocalizations um, in terms of like the behavior around their vocalizations. That's sort of more um, in the behavioral ecology side of research. Um, but yeah, that, that sounds, um, that would make sense to me because I also do think that usually when I hear that sound, there's, if I recall, I usually hear multiple birds doing it. So that would make sense. All right, awesome. And then I think we had some more questions on the second study you were talking about with related to molt. So, one of them is, um, do you have any suggestions for what the implications might be if birds molted later because of weather, wetter weather, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it matters 
the condition of their feathers. And so at this point, we don't really know whether their um, changing the timing of their molt helps them or whether um, there's a, still a mismatch. In other words, if there's a mismatch between optimal resource availability and when the birds are molting, they're gonna be molting poorer quality feathers. And that could have carryover effects into migration and into breeding the subsequent year. So we know that the birds are shifting when they're molting year to year based on the climate conditions. What we don't know is whether they're like matching perfectly the optimal period or whether they're sort of falling short. And so luckily feather condition actually is something that you can examine based on the structure of the feathers. And so that is something we could look at in the future to see, okay, in years when birds are molting later, is the structure of the feather different from years when they're molting earlier? And so we can sort of get at that question. So it's sort of too early to know right now what the long-term impact might be. We can sort of just say, we can confidently say that they're changing when they're molting. We don't yet know what the implications of that might be. Nice, and then related to that, uh, there was another question about uh, the hypothesis that birds change the timing of their molt in response to reduced nutrients available that would be necessary for a successful molt suggests that birds have foresight and can plan ahead. Do you think this is the case? And are there other hypotheses that might explain molt timing differences as a function of precipitation or temperature? Yeah, um, all organisms have the ability to sort of detect changes in their environment and respond. And so, uh, photo period is a really big one um, across every group of organisms. You can probably find this something related to light sensitivity. And so as day length changes, there are chemical pathways that are triggered inside the cells of birds that result in changes to their body to prepare them for what's coming. And so as day length gets shorter, going from essentially today, because we're near the summer solstice, to the fall and winter, there are chemical pathways that are triggered that prepare the bird's body for migration, right? A bird needs to be prepared to go into its life stage, otherwise it's not going to do it successfully. Um, and so they do have the ability to detect changes in their environment and respond for the future. Um, it's the extent to which that is a conscious decision that a bird is sort of like planning and knowing versus a subconscious thing that just happens, um, we don't really know. Um, and that would be a really difficult thing to sort of address because of course we can't ask the birds um, these questions and get responses. But we do know that they um, respond ahead of time to changes in their environment. Great, right, thank you for that. And then I think we have more questions on the last part of your presentation too with the mist nets. So mm -hmm. um, one of them is, uh, wouldn't the habits of certain birds also play into where they are netted? For example, some birds tend to live closer to the ground, whereas some inhabit higher areas? Absolutely. And so in looking at foraging height, we're really reducing all of the behavior of a bird down to one component of its life, um, which our results show does a really good job of predicting where we catch the birds, but not all the time. And so a good example of this is morning doves, which are a ground forager. In our study, they were actually biased towards being captured at the highest point in our net. And so obviously foraging does not predict for morning doves where they are being captured. And so there are other elements of a bird's behavior that play a role. Um, and so certainly in the future, we will, we have plans to, and we want to look at other aspects of the life cycle of birds and, and how that might contribute. This was sort of just like an initial study. Um, and we chose Foraging Guild because um, feeding is, is an important part of sort of like a bird, the life of a bird day to day. They spend a lot of time foraging. And so we thought that would be a main component, but there's tons more to look at. And certainly like the mooring dove, there are exceptions to looking at foraging guild for sure. 
yeah, really interesting. Looking forward to more of those studies. Uh, so another question is, uh, if you're interested in potential bias with respect to molt, are you planning on doing things like noting the height at which molting individuals are caught compared with non-molting or average height caught at different times of year? Yes. Um, so another part of our capture height study that I did not talk about, just because I only was sort of briefly touching on each study, was time of year. And so we looked across the seasons for our different species. And we found that five of our of the our species of the 40 species that we looked at were caught at different heights throughout the year. Um, and so there certainly could be changes um, based on molting or breeding. For example, if the resources that a bird needs <clears throat> to molt are low to the ground. And during the molt period, they're spending more time foraging low to the ground. We might expect that they would be captured lower during that period. So um, yeah, there's a lot that can be done with that data as well. Yeah, so much interesting information you can start to pull from all this data. Uh, and then uh, another question about the misnets. Are you thinking that the results of the stacked MISNET experiments might possibly change interpretations of data in some of the previous 40-year studies at the same banding site? That's an interesting question. I don't think we have enough information now to make conclusions like that. I think the main thing of interest that might affect how we interpret data is whether there are differences in um, capture height between uh, habitats in, with different habitat structure. And so at our study site, there are sort of four habitats. There's a grassy meadow that doesn't have any woody vegetation. So the vegetation is really low to the ground. Mm -hmm. There are two younger riparian areas that were restored over the past 30 years. And then there's a mature riparian corridor um, that's at least 80 years old, possibly older. And so the structure between those habitats is slightly different. And so if it were the case that birds are being captured at different heights in those different habitats, that might have implications for how we examine data when we're comparing across habitats. It might have implications for how we examine data and we're looking across time because the habitats change over time. Um, we don't yet know if that's the case. So it's sort of too early to sort of say anything like that, but it's theoretically possible. Well, and then uh, thinking about some of the newer sites that you're banding at, uh, the question is, will banding continue at Jasper Ridge and Los Trancos? And what does the future hold for those sites? Yeah, I certainly hope so. Um, I'm. I'm still currently banding there. Um, and there's a lot of wonderful volunteers and people at SFBBO who are, and Stanford who are helping to support that. Uh, like Katie mentioned, there's a collaboration um, going on between SFBBO, Stanford, and some other local colleges and universities that hopefully is gonna be able to secure some funding to keep these projects going in the future to use them for various education and student research opportunities. So we certainly hope, and it looks like it, they will continue for sure. Um, I, I just also will put in that um, we're, we're planning to uh, have more of our CCFS volunteers going out to these new sites in the near future. Um, and uh, we're, we're awaiting some crucial permits for that is, is the, is the holdup, but um, yeah, SFBDO is, is really committed to um, keeping these sites going. And that is really exciting to hear. Uh, so I just saw another question just come in right now uh, with regard to birds being recaptured several times. Do you think that some eventually learn to avoid that spot, even if they can't see the mist nets? That's a really wonderful question. And that is another area of research that is, has been understudied. Um, and it's one that Katie and I have talked extensively about. And if, you know, if we had unlimited resources and unlimited time, 
we would already have projects going for this. So it's, it's we're thinking about it. Um, certainly birds have behavior and they're able to learn and respond. And so do birds learn um, to avoid certain locations if they get captured? Probably, probably to a certain extent they do. But then we also look at our data and we see that we have song sparrows that we've captured 40 times over their life, life right? And so, you know, what we have birds in our database, many birds in our database, and I say song sparrows because they're our most commonly captured bird that, you know, we'll capture twice a year, every year for a decade type of thing, you know? And so the extent to which whatever their avoidance is actually affects our ability to follow the birds through time is probably pretty minimal, you know? Um, probably sort of my assumption based on sort of our data is that there's probably a short-term avoidance on the order of like days or weeks, um, not a sort of long-term learned avoidance um, on the order of like years or a lifetime. That said, all the time we will capture birds multiple times in a single day. We might even recapture them in the same net location an hour later. And so, you know, the extent to which this really impacts our data is probably not, um, for most species, significant. For some species, here's the caveat that I think is really important. For some species that are highly intelligent, like corvids, so our scrub jays, our stellars jays, they probably have, a, um, they might have sort of that long-term memory and avoidance. Um, and so for those types of species, uh, there could be some effects going on there. And that would be really interesting to look at. Um, and certainly it is something that is on our radar and that we hope to examine. Because it, you know, if birds are avoiding, um, even if it's on an order of only days or weeks, that still has an impact of how we interpret our data. And so we would want to know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and then we do have uh, another question that kind of looks at big picture things. Uh, does the banding data at Coyote Creek Field Station indicate a decline in bird populations? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. For some species, yes. For other species, no, which is good, I guess. So for a lot of, unfortunately, are long distance migrant species like um, Swates and Thrush, Yellow Warbler, Willow Flycatcher. A lot of them we've noticed have really been declining over the past 40 years in terms of like what we're capturing. We have noticed, um, and sorry, I'll add, and that follows broader continent-wide trends in those species. And so it's important to separate out site-specific patterns from sort of broader population patterns. And so there are some species, for example, like house finches that have declined at our study site that sort of like broadly across the range have actually expanded. Um, they've expanded across, you know, Three decades ago, they used to only be in sort of Central and Western North America. And they, over the past 30 years, have had this massive range expansion into Eastern North America, right? And so at our study site, we've had a decline in them, but sort of like broadly, they're doing pretty okay because they've expanded their range, you know? So it's important when we're sort of looking at what's happening at our site is to also keep in mind sort of broader patterns. We have noticed at our site there are some sort of um, cavity nesting species like Buix wrens, white-breasted nuthatch, hairy woodpecker um, that have rapidly been increasing at our study site over the past decade. Um, really like the white-breasted nuthatch and the hairy woodpecker up until about 2015 
were never captured at our study site. And now they're becoming um, somewhat of a regular species for us to capture. So sort of these cavity nesters are becoming more common, which might have to do with sort of the habitat change as the habitat gets older, more trees die, as more trees die, more cavities become available for birds to nest in. Um, so there's sort of like a mix. I think mostly we're seeing lots of declines, but there are some species where we're seeing increases. So as with so many things in biology or ecology, it depends. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that is the last question that I'm seeing. So first of all, thank you so much, Julian, for that wonderful presentation and answering those questions so expertly. Uh, I want to ask Katie, is there anything you want to say to Julian or to everybody? Uh, I just, yeah, I want to repeat that, Julian. Thanks so much. And everyone, thanks for, uh, thanks for asking some actually really insightful questions and uh, for being here today. And, and, you know, just, just keep thinking about the birds that are that are all around us. I mean, these banding stations are are right in the Bay Area, right right next to where everybody's living. These are not, you know, exotic, far away places. So, um, yeah, these are our local birds. Thanks, Katie. And then Julian, is there anything you want to say to everybody before we sign off? Oh, well, I just thank you to everyone for listening um, and for being involved with SFBBO. All right. Thanks again, Julian. Again, really, really enjoyed your presentation and the Q&A. Thank you again, everybody, for tuning in. And we hope to see you again at a future event. Have a great evening. Mm -hmm.